viewers, please check out Frontiers of Mind. Please support Professor Kastner and you know, tell your siblings about it, tell your family about it, and inform the young generation about Frontiers of Mind because we need more people to know about neuroscience. And um, you know, neuroscience can impact all different types of fields. It's not just science. So, like, you know please check it out you you can improve yourself knowing more about the brain so um yes i uh, can i just say one more thing about yeah. that it really can help you to understand yourself better better if you want to learn about memory why you learn better if you have a good night's sleep i mean you can learn about so many things that are really relevant to your life and you will understand why that is and probably then also be uh, a little bit more careful with, with what you're doing. Um, so I, I think it's really, really cool thing to start to understand what's going on, on you know, up there. Yeah, definitely. And check out brainfacts.org too. Um, Professor, Cass, uh, Ca Professor Casey and Professor Kastner both work at brainfacts.org. So please check out all the interesting information to learn more about the brain. So hi everyone, this is Rachel back with another video here on Live Study Hacks. Today we have a special guest, Professor Sabine Kastner, currently a professor at Princeton Neuroscience Institute. She's studying how the brain weeds out important information from everyday scenes. Using functional magnetic resonance imaging, Professor Kastner is able to peek inside a brain and see what areas are active when a person sees a face, place, or objects. Most impressively, Professor Kastner did her postdoctoral research at the National Institute for Mental Health, and her research is funded by the National Science Foundation. She has written the Oxford Handbook of Attention and started the Youth Young Frontier of Mind Foundation to encourage other kids to learn more about neuroscience. Today, we're going to look at learn more about her research regarding how large scale networks achieve cognition. So I'm so happy to have you on the um, on our show and on our channel. Uh, Professor Kastner, do you have any words to share? Well, thanks for having me, Rachel. This is really, really exciting. And I look forward to, you know, our conversation today. And I hope that um, I can tell you something interesting about my research. Thank you. So uh, we're going to dive into our first question. And um, we're going to look. So my first question is looking at the brain models of human and the masculine monkey brain using methods like the fMRI and electrophysiology, your research has proven a new way in rethinking the visual process path pathway through research done at your lab with the thalamus. Can you explain to the viewers of the first like Beatles analogy with attention slash cognition and what exactly is the visual processing pathway and how your research area is associated with the thalamus region of the brain? So I think those are a lot of questions in, in one question that, that you asked there. So uh, probably I can tell you a little bit about my training because that, that is helpful to understanding why I'm interested in what I study. So I study, um, as you said, vision and the, the pathways in the brain that mediate vision. Uh, but I'm not only interested in vision uh, per se. So vision is interesting because primates, not only humans, but also other primates like monkeys or apes are extremely visual animals. So we really enjoy vision. We you know, enjoy the environments, the visual environments that we are living in. And that is reflected in the way our brains are organized. One third, one third of our brains um, is dedicated to vision. So there are many, many different regions in the brain mainly in the posterior part of the brain um, that are specialized to process visual information. And one third of a brain is kind of a really, you know, huge real estate. So it's, it's more than, for instance, the language network um, occupies. It's more than your network for mathematical cognition occupies and so on and so forth. So it's a really important sense that gets represented there. And, um, we hope that basically by understanding vision, we would be able to understand principles of how, how sensory information more broadly is represented. So this could also be very similar 
for acoustic information or for touch information and so on and so forth. Um, so the, uh, this is one reason why I'm interested um, in vision. And I was trained as a vision scientist. So my first training was kind of in, in pure vision, if you like. Uh, but then after that, um, when uh, after graduate school, um, I became interested in um, what we call cognition. So cognition is everything that we do basically in our with our brains that's a little bit more sophisticated. Anything what you would call as related to thinking, I become became particularly interested in studying attention. Um, so that's the way we focus. We select. Um, information from our sensory environments that are typically cluttered, or sometimes we also select information from, from our internal representations. So for instance, if you are thinking and you're thinking about, you know, several different things at the same time, you're selecting one thing that you follow through and that you will, you know, uh, think more about, but you will not, you know, uh, continue to just randomly think about, um, you know, many things. So that's a se selection that you can also do to your kind of inner representations. And I find that in an interesting problem because we have so much clutter in our environment. So there's so much information there and how can we now develop mechanisms that allow us to focus on the information that is really um, the most important for us at any moment given in time for whatever reason. Um, but um, that is basically what, what I studied next during my postdoctoral studies. And those were also done, as you said, at the National Institute of Mental Health. So I learned a lot about attention there. Um, and then in my laboratory at Princeton, I, I have continued both of these things. So I've studied a lot of uh, vision, but I also studied a lot of uh, attention mechanisms and things that are related to it. And we really try to understand how these uh, things work, what we call at a mechanistic level. So it's you can think about it like um, a car motor, motor. So you can drive a car without knowing how this uh, motor that um, that that um, you know drives your car operates. Right. This is kind of how our brain um, operates for us. We don't need to understand it in order to think and in order for it to, to produce something. But at the end of the day, we can only help people uh, who have, for instance, a disorder of some sort with their brains if we really understand how things work. So you can only repair a motor if you understand how the, the different parts are fitting together, how they relate to each other and how they work together. Um, and that's basically the kind of understanding that, that we try uh, to accomplish. Um, you also mentioned two different methods, main methods that I'm using, and I study two different brains. I study the human brain, and I study that from development actually all the way to the adult brain and to patients with brain lesions. So uh, many things in the human brain that uh, we study in my lab. Um, and I study also the, uh, the monkey brain. And um, what we do in terms of methods is we can visualize what happens in a brain when we do something with it, when we look at faces. Or right now I'm talking a lot when you know my language network is active and so on. We can visualize that with this method that I don't know if you talked about that in your shows already. It's called functional magnetic resonance imaging. And it's a non-invasive method, so it's, you know, uh, not something that, that is harmful in any ways that uh, one can do to uh, visualize activity in uh, your brain and in my brain and in everybody's brains. Um, you can do that also in monkeys. And uh, a second method that we are using that you also mentioned is electrophysiology. Um, the brain, just to give a little bit of background here, is organized. Um, or the, the currency, let's say, that the brain is using is electrical activity that um, nerve cells are producing and it flows through uh, large brain networks and somehow drives behavior. And in a nutshell, this is what we try to understand. Um, but we can record this electrical activity in single nerve cells or from single nerve cells, also from larger 
populations of cells. Um, but we basically try to understand um, how information from the environment is um, represented there. So it's like you, you try to understand um, a Rosetta Stone. So there got to be some kind of way this information is coded, but we don't know what, what that kind of way is, what that alphabet is. Um, and we try to, to understand uh, that. And we can only do that really by um, reporting from directly from nerve cells with wires, with small wires. Um, and those are painless uh, procedures because the nervous system does not have pain receptors. So, you know, when I describe that, sometimes people say, oh, this is just horrible. Um, how can you do that? This must be very harmful. It's actually also done in people who undergo brain surgery for that reason, because uh, the brain does not have pain receptors. So it's a completely painless method. Uh, so we take advantage of that, um, that we can approach the brain even with these wires and record the electrical activity. Um, why do I use monkey and human brains? That's the last point, I'm, and then I give it back to you. You may have more questions about that. Um, so I started when I went to graduate school, which is a long time ago, it's about 30 years ago. I started with uh, the monkey brain because at that time, there was really no way to study the human brain. So this method functional magnetic resonance imaging that we use these days was just invented after I graduated from graduate school. And so at the time, the best model that we had for human brain function that I was very interested in because I'm also a medical doctor and I was always you know, interested in really learning about our own brains and uh, not necessarily about, you know, the brains of monkeys, but we used that as the best model at the time that we had. And once functional magnetic resonance imaging was invented as a method, uh, that was the reason why I went to the National Institutes uh, of Mental Health, because I could learn this very new method at the time there in the later 90s, 1990s. And um, that was uh, uh, the the point actually when I started to study human brains. Um, but there are things that we can simply not do in human brains because we cannot use the methods that we can use in monkey brains and so on. So the monkey brain is still a very, very important model for us to, um, to understand at a much deeper level how our own brains operate. So for that reason, I have always kind of kept these, these two uh, things together because they, they're very complementary. So you can learn from one thing that you cannot learn from the other.